Okay, so in this video we're going to go through our glenohumeral joint uh, active range of motion. And um, so again, we were talking about this earlier, you, you could do this in, sti in sitting or in standing. If they're pain, and you're going to do that relative, relative to their subjective um, examination. So if they're getting their pain when they're in a standing position, then you probably get more information from doing it standing. If they get pain sitting and standing, you might want to do both. Um, and if it's more of a maybe a, a postural type shoulder neck issue, then you might look at this in sitting because again, it's more relative to their specific symptoms. Um, so we're just going to, for the purpose of the video, do this in, in standing, but obviously you could do these, these movements in sitting as well. So we're going to go through flexion first. So PJ, thumbs facing forwards and then coming up towards the ceiling as far as you can go. Again, obviously with this we're looking at, um, I would often do this looking from behind, so uh, and then come back down. So you're looking for range of motion, symptom reproduction. As you can see on PJ on this left hand side, we're also looking for what the, sh the scapula is doing through that motion. And there's a bit of um, uh, dysfunction or um, some differences in terms of the left to, to right. Again, you can't just say because someone has these things that's necessarily a problem, but you'd be putting it into your mind as, okay, I'd be wanting to take a closer look at this sort of thing and whether we can modify or um, change that and what does that do to the symptoms. We're going to go through that in the, another video. Um, so then we would go with abduction, so coming out to the side PJ as high as you can go and all the way up. Again, I tend to, we were talking about this earlier as well, not give them too much cueing to start with because I just want to see how they naturally do that movement. If they then did it in a way where you wanted to see something slightly different, you could then cue them in certain ways to, to get them to move in a certain way. But to start with, just get them to do it how they would naturally do it because that's going to be what they're probably going to be programmed or you know to do naturally anyway. Um, so then we can go with our uh, hand behind the back. So let's go left hand behind the back. We are discussing earlier what you could do is then mark that level or mentally I tend to, I think Glenn marks, but I tend to just do it um, where I'll just think of the level and just note down the level and then back down and then change sides. It's important to note what you're measuring as well. So yeah. is, it, is it the thumb? Yeah. Is it the index finger? Is it the middle finger? Yeah. I use the thumb. I don't think there's a right yeah, or wrong thumb, there as yeah. long as you reproduce it each yeah. time. Yeah. So actually with this, PJ went fingers with the left, but actually he went thumb with the right. So I might just say to PJ again, come back round, do the same thing on the left, but just have your thumb on the spine, and then you can again have that as a standardised amount. Obviously, you can see on PJ as well, it's slightly tighter on the right hand side, which again for a lot of people who are right hand dominant, which PJ is, you're going to find that is the case. And um, so again, just because someone's got a reduction in range of motion doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem. You want to relate that to all of your um, other tests. Then we go into extension as well, so thumbs facing forwards and then pulling the hands back behind you as far as you can go. Again, just looking for um, how much range they've got, symptom reproduction, those things. Then we're going to go elbows at your side, 90 degrees with the, the, hat, the elbows, and then bring your hands out to the side while maintaining as if your elbows are glued to your side. That's what I generally use as a cue. I don't know about you, Glenn, what you yeah, use. something similar. Cool. And then again, you're looking for the amount of external rotation and then relax. So that's external rotation, hand behind the back, more of your medial rotation. Uh, then you've got your flexion, abduction, um, and extension. Obviously with these movements, if they were um, pain-free, we could then do our overpressure scan. So should we do that in sitting? Yeah, I think sitting, sometimes you get um, clients a lot taller, so you're yep. struggling in standing. Sitting's a nice standard way to do that. Yep. I generally tend to only overpress flexion and abduction. So if we get you to flex your left arm up for me here, once we get to that end position, I'm going to just stabilise over the scap and create a little bit of overpressure through the glenohumeral joint. Again, you're looking for symptom reproduction, yeah, mm -hmm. mainly. And then if we get abduction, so taking your arm out to the side, I'm going to come into the side here, same thing, this right hand's going to stabilise over the scapula, and then I'm going to just press the left. Yeah, try and lower my arm so you can see there. And then back down. Yeah. Obviously you can pair the other side as well just to get an idea of how that infill is both yeah. sides. Yes, yeah, so it's more looking for end field, aren't you? This obviously like you said, pain yeah. and reproduction symptoms. Um I I as well, like Glenn was just saying, I just generally tend not to do the lateral rotation or medial rotation mm -hmm. uh, over pressures. Um, I think it is a is a little bit of a vulnerable position for a lot of people, especially someone in pain. And so I don't think yeah. a lot of the time it's not gonna if you know 
especially obviously what we mentioned if they are in pain in the shoulder these movements are often going to be painful so i don't think yeah. it gives you that much valuable information to to do that yeah, and it could right. just be a, a you know making them more flare them up for no real real benefit if that makes sense yeah, I mean, in that scenario, you wouldn't overpress regarding the pain. Yeah. And if you did, you might sort of flare up the problem, which would then give a false positive on every other test that you went yeah. on to do. Yeah, definitely. definitely. The other big thing about the, the shoulder, again, as we mentioned in the thoracic video, was uh, be aware of what's going on in the thoracic spine and yeah. the cervical. So if they are sticking here, is it a restriction in the glenohumeral joint or is it a, lock, a lack of extension in yeah. the thoracic spine? And that's where you can do, do little cues, isn't it? To mm. you know, just things like we were talking about the fish hook on the on the chest bone. So imagine yeah. you've got a fish hook on that chest bone, pulling you up towards the ceiling, um, and then again, does that change their their amount of range of movement? Does it change their symptoms? Um, that's a simple thing you can do. And again, like you just said as well, looking at survival spine as well, so looking at the mm. neck and seeing whether there's any kind of compensations there as they're doing that that movement. Um, yeah. So it's the weight of the arm pulling through the soft tissues into the neck and creating an issue there. So you'd obviously, yeah. with all shoulder pain, you'd clear the cervical spine first. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect.